Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Eastern Cape Centre Annual General Meeting. Um, before we start, just a few webinar considerations. Attendees are reminded to ensure the volume is turned up on their device. Ensure you have a stable internet connection. This will ensure the streaming and audio will run smoothly. Attendees can ask questions via the questions panel located within the GoToWebinar control panel. By default, the control panel is located on the right-hand side of your screen. The chat function is reserved for webinar organizers and panelists to communicate with attendees. Attendees will not be able to chat with each other, however, are encouraged to ask questions. A, record, uh, excuse me, a recording of the presentation will be made available on the SAIE YouTube channel, SAIE TV. The recording will also be made available on the SAIE website under the events drop down menu in the section past events and webinars. This page is updated regularly, so ensure you check back as often as possible for new uploads and subscribe to our YouTube channel. A certificate of attendance will be issued a few weeks after this webinar, once we have received the CPD validation number from EXA. I'll now introduce you to your host this evening, Simpiwe Mbanga, who is the chairman of the SI Eastern Cape Centre. Simpiwe graduated from the University of Cape Town with a BSc Elect Engineering Light Current in 1997. He started as an engineer in training in 1998. He soon registered as a candidate engineer with the Engineering Council of South Africa, then became PR, then became PR Eng in 2003. He is a senior member of the SAIE and is currently the SAI Eastern Cape Centre Chairman. He has worked in several departments in ESCOM, which includes telecoms, SCADA, and telecontrol. And he is now a senior engineer in standards implementation. He furthered his studies to obtain a BEng Honours degree in 2004 at the University of Pretoria and a Master's in Business Leadership at the School of Business Leadership at UNISA in 2014. I hand you over now to the Chairman. Thanks a lot, uh, Mix for such a colorful and a nice uh, introduction. I would like to welcome all our SAIE Eastern Cape Center members. Uh, what's going to happen right now, we are going to look at your attendance as per the agenda that is shown. Uh, this will be as per the number that we see under attendees which will be posted to us by Minx. So you don't have to do anything to show that you have attended or not. Then for the people who have apologized, the emails have been sent to our administrator, Lizzie, and that will be captured as such. As of now, I see we've got 27 uh, attendees, uh, which is quite great. Uh, we are also going to do a quick finalization of the agenda. So our members can make use of the questions uh, tab since they cannot use any other tabs to raise any other matters which would be included into the agenda. So if there's nothing to, I will continue to look there before we get to the other side uh, where we'll be going with the terms of our own uh, AGM. But now it is uh, the part for on our agenda where I will introduce and welcome our honorary keynote speaker, Professor David Zemebier, who is the Emeritus Professor of Control Engineering. David Lembier was educated at Michael House School in South Africa. He received his BSc Engineering Cum Laude from the University of Bedford Rand in 1974. The MSc Eng Cum Laude and PhD degrees from University of Natal in 1977 and 1980, respectively. The, DC, the DSc Eng degree from the University of London in 1992 and an MA from Oxford University in 2009. He was a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Cambridge between 1980 and 1984. 
He then joined electrical and electronic engineering department, Imperial College London, as a lecturer. He was promoted to reader in 1989, professor in 1993, and a head of control group in 1996. He was head of the department between 1999 and 2009. From 2009 to 2018, he was a statutory professor at the University of Oxford and a professorial fellow with the new college, Oxford. He is currently an emeritus professor with the University of Oxford an Emeritus Fellow with New College, Oxford, a Distinguished Professor with the University of Johannesburg, and an Extraordinary Professor with the University of Pretoria. His research interests include applied and theoretical problems in control systems and engineering dynamics. Please join me to welcome our Honorable Professor the floor is yours, Professor. Please mesmerize us with your presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me. I'm going Mr. to, okay. I'm, I'm going to speak to you this afternoon about uh, work that I've done over a number of years on, on two-wheeled road vehicles. Um, my email address is at the bottom if anybody's interested in making contact to ask questions or, 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 or anything like that. So I'm going to begin by mentioning some of the collaborators that uh, helped me conduct this work um, over a number of years. Uh, I think it would be unfair to give the impression that then somehow I did this all on my own, which is completely untrue. I'm then going to give some historical perspectives and briefly outline the what I think is extremely interesting history of uh, bicycles and motorcycles. I'm then going to talk about some of the uh, important dynamical aspects of uh, two-wheeled road vehicles in, in, uh, in general. Um, and then moving to the present time, I'm going to say a little bit about um, modeling tires and suspension systems in, in high fidelity models. I'll then talk about some optimal control and uh, then some practical test results that were done by Ducati in Italy, and uh, I'll end off with some conclusions. So the collaborators um, listed on this slide were a, a mixture of PhD students, postdocs, and academics from around the around the world really a mixture of of americans and mostly europeans and uh i thought it was worth mentioning particularly uh ingrid salisbury because she's a, a young lady from uh, durban actually who uh joined me for a for a, a phd degree in oxford and is uh, now working uh with Mercedes Formula One and, and, and doing really rather well there. This is a sort of a, a family snap of a few of us at the Ducati Museum in uh, Bologna. And I wanted to point out particularly, particularly uh, Professor Robin Sharp, who sadly died rather recently. 
and uh, he, 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 I would say, is somebody who knows more about bicycles and motorcycles than pretty much anyone in the world. So um, that was a that was indeed a loss. So let's talk a little bit about the history. Um, because I personally find it quite interesting. So um, it all started with a volcano. And as some of you may know, there, there was an eruption of Tambura in 1815, which uh, according to people who know about these things was the, the most powerful uh, volcanic eruption in, in recorded history. Um, the, the ash column enveloped the whole world, lowering temperatures and led to what came to be known as the, as the year without summer. And uh, these extreme weather conditions caused uh, harvest failures around the world. I can hear you all saying, what's this got to do about bicycles? So necessity being the mother of invention, um, at the time of the Tambura eruption, the uh, predominant mode of transport was the horse. Because of these adverse weather conditions, oats became prohibitively expensive and horses became too expensive for many people to keep. And uh, this led to the German aristocrat Baron Karl von Dreyers to contemplate a horse that you didn't have to feed. This here is a, a picture of uh, the first bicycle. Um, you can see the, uh, the manufacturing probably has leaves something to be desired. Um, Key features of this uh, bicycle, it had no brakes, it had no tires, it had no mechanical drive mechanism. Nobody knew that at this time that bicycles would balance without uh, putting your feet on the floor. So it was indeed uh, pro propelled a little bit like uh, the famous Fred S S uh, Flintstone car with the feet sticking out the bottom. Now, with that uh, arguably humble uh, start, the, the bicycle then evolved um, over the next uh, 40 or 50 years or so. Um, here are some of the examples of uh, evolutionary changes and you'll see that the hobby horse is really just an upgrade of the drazine. The, the bone shaker has got pedals on the front drive wheel. And in fact, the, the story goes that um, somebody with a hobby horse took it in to, to have some repair, uh, some repair work done on it. And the, the proprietor's son sat on this thing and discovered that he could roll down the hill without putting any feet on the floor. So with that accidental discovery, somebody then said, well, let's put some drive wheels on the front wheel and uh, some pedals on the front wheel. And that led to the, the bone shaker. Now, because of gearing considerations, it became apparent that if you wanted to pick up speed, with uh, a directly driven wheel, you have to make the front wheel bigger. And this led to the, the penny farthing bicycle that everybody knows about with this um, very large front wheel um, introduced to uh, give the rider improved speed without uh, going crazy pedaling it. The next... Uh, the next evolution was the discovery of the chain drive, um, which then got rid of the need to have the very unsafe front wheel. And then uh, 
tires were introduced and women started riding bicycles. So the step, the step through frame uh, came into being and uh, such as many uh, uh, evolutionary processes. This is a, I, th I think, quite an interesting diagram. So on the on the y-axis, we've got the nutritional cost per gram per kilo per kilometer for all manner of things. So very inefficient at the top of the diagram. I'm just going to see if I can make a pen work. We've got mice and lemmings. Then a bit more efficient, we get uh, blow flies, fruit flies, bees, and rats. Then locusts, hummingbirds, rabbits. We've got various forms of man-made transport over here, helicopters, jet fighters, light planes, automobiles. And then we've got a, 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 a collection of dogs, sheep, um, men, and horses. Now, this is where the unassisted man sits. Out of the whole uh, kingdom of living creatures, the, the salmon seems to be the most efficient. But you put a man on a bicycle, and from a nutritional efficiency perspective, he, 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 blows, up, he blows up the, the entire animal, insect, fish, and bird kingdoms. It was almost inevitable that somebody was going to try to put some uh, an engine drive of some sort on a bicycle. And then in the, towards the end of the 19th century, this was done by uh, Sylvester Roper, who put a very crude looking uh, steam engine on a, on a, on a bicycle and uh, made the first power assisted two wheeled vehicle there's some controversy about whether we can call this a motorcycle because it's not a, a petrol engine he's also supposed to have been the first motorcycle cycle related death but um i, I think the, the the research shows that he actually had a heart attack rather than uh being uh the direct vision of a the direct victim of a, of a motorcycle crash. Um, personally, I'm not terribly keen on having a, a high pressure steam vessel between my legs, but anyway, that's just maybe me. Then a little bit later, when uh, Maybeck and Daimler were developing the petrol engine for use in cars, they also installed it on a motorcycle. So this is this is really the first petrol-powered motorcycle with uh, a grandfather a grandfather clock engine. So this was really right at the beginning of the 20th century, or right at the end of the 19th century. Now, now I'm I'm showing you this picture just to give you. Uh, some sort of idea of the, uh, the, the rich collection of, of possibilities when it comes to examining the design parameter space. One can have a huge range of wheelbases, a huge range of uh, steering axis inclination angles, uh, mass distributions, uh, and, and so on. I've never ridden this bike, but I would guess that it's it's great until you want to go around corners. Um, very nice to go down the down the road slowly and admire yourself in the shop windows and so on. And this is really where we are today. So this is the Ducati Desmo Sedici GP19 race bike. Um, its dry weight is only 157 kilograms. The engine power is about 
250 horsepower, and uh, it's capable of speeds in excess of 220 miles an hour. Uh, one of the Ducati test riders referred to this machine as like taking a gun to a pillow fight. So, a couple of philosophical comments which I think are important for any students who are interested in working in this area. I, I, I think it goes without saying that humans are incredibly inventive when it comes to um, developing gadgets that improve our lives. Another noteworthy example is the computer. Now, with computers in um, in, in mind, uh, and speaking as an edu engineering educator, I would advise be sensible with computers. Use them as well as your brains and not instead of your brains. Uh, this is a, a, a temptation that some students succumb to. Now, before we get onto the onto the harder stuff, uh, I'm just going to outline a couple of rules which come from uh, one's most trusted advisor, which is normally your wife. Um, and she she said, "Limit the boring mathematics. Remember people like me. She's she's a sociologist, and." Uh, Sociologists find it hard to relate to the wise words of Galileo Galilei from the from the 17th century, who said the the universe, which while permanently open to our gaze, cannot be understood unless one first learns the language in which it is composed. It is written in the language of mathematics, without which it is impossible to understand a single word. Uh, I agree with that. So, anybody who's interested in the details can go and have a, a look in this book, Dynamics and Optimal Control of Road Vehicles. Um, and, and I know it's an extremely good book because I wrote it. So, Let's take a let's take a, di a a change of direction into the the more theoretical aspects of the of the subject, and although I'm probably not completely unbiased, it all started in Cambridge. This is a slightly busy slide, but. Um, I think it, 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 it captures all the main players. So these are, these are all people who did the mathematics tripos at Cambridge. Um, in, in 1665, uh, Isaac Newton completed the tripos. And of course, he subsequently developed um, all the fundamental laws of classical mechanics. Then in... Uh, 1854, both James Clark Maxwell and Ralph graduated from the Tripos. Um, everybody expected uh, Maxwell to come top, but he actually came second and Ralph came top. Um, early in the 20th century, uh, Albert Einstein observed that the, the theories of Newton and Maxwell were incompatible with the incompatible incompatibility uh, resolved only by the development of the theory of special relativity uh, that's a side comment but i think an interesting one this this gentleman here francis whipple uh, graduated from the tripos in in 1897 and we're going to have some more to say about him and he was tutored by Ralph. Uh, all the control guys out there will probably recall Ralph as being the uh, the developer of the of the Ralph criterion, which is used for 
determining the stability of uh, linear systems. Another interesting bit of history is every year when the, the, the math tripos results are um, announced, the students all go to Senate House in Cambridge and the results are thrown over a balcony for them to gather up. Uh, my wife is a deputy uh, vice chancellor at UNICE and I, sometimes I get the impression they still do the exams like this. Um, before the days of political correctness, the, the worst student on the tripos who actually passed was awarded a wooden spoon, but that, that custom ended in 1909. So these are, the, these are some of the players that we're going to uh, bump into again. Uh, Ralph was a fellow of Peter House in Cambridge, and I think Peter House is the oldest, uh, the oldest, the oldest college um, dating back to the 13th century, if, if I'm correct. And I can only imagine Francis Whipple going along to Peter House to do. Uh, tutorial sessions in, a, in, a, in applied mechanics. And I'm going to look at a few of these, two or three of these uh, problems from uh, Ralph's notes, which are, are relevant to the bicycle. In this, in this particular diagram, um, I, I'm, I'm contemplating a spinning disc, and we could think of the front wheel of a bicycle. When when we apply a vertical torque to the spinning disk, so the angular momentum vector is horizontal because the, 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 the wheel's spinning as it normally would on a bicycle. And then if we apply a, a steering torque, what happens, and, the, the, and this is a direct consequence of gyroscopic moments, is the, the front wheel leans in the direction opposite to the steering. So if you steer left, the, the wheel will, will roll to the right. Put that in the memory, it's going to come up again. In another, in, a, in another example, again, we've got the front wheel of a bicycle spinning. And if that if that wheel is leant over, so if the bicycle starts leaning, you will get a steering moment which steers the wheel into the lean. So as soon as the bicycle starts falling over, the front wheel will steer in a direction to so as to catch the machine, if you like. So this is another um, a gyroscopic uh, of effect that... Um, is going to be part of our story. A much more a much more difficult example is this one here, where we roll a disc along a, a tabletop, and and you can do this experiment yourself. If you get a compact disc, and you and you started rolling on the top of a desk or on, on, on a floor, you'll see initially the the disc will. We'll run, we'll run along in a straight line just fine. And very, and very gradually, as the speed starts falling off because of uh, friction losses and so on, the disc will then start to wobble, and then it'll finally fall over. And uh, Ralph derived this beautiful little formula that says the, the disc will keep spinning provided its angular velocity is greater than the square root of g over 3r. g is gravity, r is the radius of the disk. So in other words, we, what we've got here is an introduction to the idea of speed-dependent stability. And, and indeed, if you look at the analysis in a little bit more detail, at high speed, we have a complex conjugate pair of poles on the imaginary axis. And then as the speed drops, these poles come together 
and then they're split along the real and imaginary axis. And this critical speed is when the uh, when the root locus here uh, bifurcates away from the imaginary axis. So those are three little bits of mechanics that um, I'm just going to ask you to uh, trust me because I'm a professor. Now, let's have a look at this. And so we can see this motorcycles going along without any problem, without a rider. It then starts steering into the direction of the fall. So at least at a, at least at, a, at, at an intuitive level, we 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 we're seeing the first. Um, inklings of steering into the fall and speed dependent stability. Now, I mentioned earlier Francis Whipple um, as being one of Ralph's students. And uh, Whipple, Whipple was, a, was a brilliant student and um, went on to have uh, an extremely uh, illustrious career as, as a mathematician and a physicist. He, he um, actually came second in the, in the maths tripos at Cambridge, and he entered for the, uh, for the Smith Prize at the age of 23, a paper describing the, the dynamics of the bicycle. And this model essentially has a rear frame that's connected flexibly to the front frame through a, a steering, a, a steering uh, assembly. Now, You'll see here that the, the steering is raked and the distance between the, the ground contact intercept of the steering axis and the front wheel ground contact point is the trail. This is called the trail. Also important is the fact that the, the mass center of the front steered assembly is located above the steering axle. Now, you can see that this is a, a problem in multi-body mechanics with, with spinning components connected together at strange angles. The whole, the whole device can move through large roll angles, large roll, uh, and, and large yaw angles all the ingredients for uh, making a complicated analysis problem. Anyway, Whipple did this. And I went and got Whipple's paper and, 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 and plugged the important parts of it into MATLAB. So this is like 100 years later. And it, and it plotted out this diagram here. So these dots and crosses are actually showing the uh, the eigenvalue plots of a linearized model for a bicycle running straight. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of information here. First of all, th this caster mode at the bottom is a mode that, that says that if you pick the front of the bicycle up off the floor, the steering is going to, to is going to flop over to the side, and that's because the mass center of the front of the, of the front steered assembly is above the steering axle. 
these two modes here essentially tell you that if you let a let a bicycle loose on a, on, on the garage floor at zero speed it'll fall over um we then get uh the prediction of of an oscillatory mode called weave and i'm going to talk about that in a little bit we've also got a range of of stable speeds here so in this in this region here the bicycle is actually capable of staying up on its own and again at a at, at a general level this is all tying up with uh uh, Ralph's problems and uh, what we saw on the uh, Ducati race bike at Phillip Island. And indeed, if you go and do a, a, do a simulation on, uh, on Whipple's model, it, it predicts the auto stable speed range. And it also is telling you another thing, and that is if you want to turn right, you steer in one direction at low speed and in, and, and in the opposite direction at high speed. This is a phenomenon called uh, counter steering and, and, and is, is basically related to this idea that if you steer the front wheel to point left, the bicycle is going to lean right. And uh, Anybody with a, an undergraduate training in control systems will know that uh, when you get this, uh, these right half plan zeros or, or, or this kind of counter steering, you, go, you can expect some overshoot. So when you turn left, actually the, the rear wheel will step out to the right temporarily and then come back. So without any computers at all, Whipple seems to have uh, got a lot of this right. Now, after you've, after you've been riding motorcycles for a little bit and you've uh, made a, a certain number of early morning stops at, uh, at transport caps on the, on the M1, you you hear over and over these uh, these two theories, which will I'll prove are actually myths. That bicycles balance because of gyroscopic moments, and bicycles need to need trail. You remember I described that geometric quantity called trail here with a red arrow. The red arrow is pointing to the trail. It needs one or, or other of these things to to stand up. In fact, both are wrong. Some students at uh, Cornell University and the and the Technical University of Eindhoven made this uh, this gadget, which was which they called the uh, the point mass bicycle. And you'll notice there is there are, are counter rotating uh, front wheels. So, in other words. The angular momentum of one wheel exactly counteracts the angular momentum of the other wheel. So there is no gyroscopic moment. And the, and the steering assembly has been designed in such a way that the steering axis meets the front wheel ground contact point. So there's no trail either. So we've got a bicycle with, with no trail and, uh, and no gyroscopic moments. So that's the end of those two myths. Um, quite recently, I think within the last five years, these guys uh, discovered this, and uh, there's a, a very nice little paper in science that uh, goes into all the details. Now, here's another, here's another famous old uh, 
movie that was um, done by Dunlop Tires and the commentaries by Murray Walker. And it looks at another phenomenon in motorcycle dynamics. Wobble is something that can happen at low speeds to any normal motorcycle, like this norm, if you're dark enough to take your hands off the bars. And it can happen. Wobble is... Wob wobble wasn't predicted by Whipple. Whipple's model cannot predict wobble. Now, it turns out that wobble can come from either flexibility of the frame or from uh, side slipping on the tires. But if you put the frame flexibility or, or, or in, in, this, in this diagram, it's only frame flexibility. We are indeed predicting a seven hertz oscillation in the steering. So, um, you know, this is, this is an indication that Whipple's model is an extremely good start, but it, it needs developing to uh, make it useful um, in more complicated situations. Now, with certain tires, we, we notice another thing that's happening, and that is we get a high speed instability at about three hertz. Uh, and this is, this is a so-called weave mode. And the weave mode describes a, a fishtailing motion. So if you imagine the, the motorcycle with its steering oscillating backwards and forwards, the, the machine rolling backwards and forwards, yawing backwards and forwards, that's what weave is. It's a high speed phenomenon associated with uh, either tires or the frame, or both in combination. Let's look at that. Let's look at that slowly. This is why here is the bottom of right now. I'm not going to take 10 feet off the red. He's rattling it, but he realizes he reaches the opposite curve. It's no good. And dear me, Keith, that is an enormous high speed crash right at the start of the Formula One TT. All right, Dan, that goes into the bank. The bike slides up the road at the bottom of Ray Hill. The marshal's very quick on the scene. I've got to say, superb stuff there. The Doric comes to rest in the middle of the road. They have stopped the race very, very quickly indeed. Um, that was right at the beginning of a, of a Formula One TT race. Uh, there was Paul Orrit on a, on a Honda Fireblade. Um, he told me that he, he was doing it about 120 miles an hour when that started. And in retrospect, he said he's, he's, he hadn't warmed his tires up properly. Uh, very lucky to survive. A broken wrist and I think seven broken ribs. So a bad day at the office, one way or another. So that's a little bit about uh, motorcycles uh, and, and, and their behavior. Now, let's talk a little bit about optimal control and the the work on motorcycle optimal control came out of uh, research we were doing for formula one and this is an animation that was made by uh, one of my phd students uh, giacomo perintoni and it's a it's a real-time simulation of the 2014 uh, ferrari f1 car on on barcelona with the new hybrid powertrain you can see the, um, the the Oxford gantries put on on, on, on the racetrack, which is a, a little bit cheeky. But anyway, in the in the in the car world, we were able to show that we could use uh, numerical optimal control as a way of setting up and driving a race car. 
in simulation. So, you know, as these things go, uh, the, 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 the word got around uh, and, and went from Maranello to Bologna and then Ducati wanted to know what all this was about. And so we started working with them uh, on, on motorcycle optimal control. After optimal control is really about this, and I, I'm, I'm going to try not to bore you with this slide, but essentially you, you, you have to describe, let me see if I can make this pen work. You have to describe the system you're trying to control with a bunch of nonlinear differential equations. So these will be the equations of motion of the vehicle, be it a car, be it a motorcycle or whatever. There will also be uh, constraint conditions that you have to satisfy. Uh, and the constraint conditions are going to be things like you have to stay on the racetrack, you've only got a certain amount of fuel you can use, and, and uh, there'll be limits on the tire usage. And then the optimal control problem is, given this uh, differential equation description of the system and its constraints, find the control law which uh, minimizes this performance index. In the case of pure racing, it's particularly easy because the performance index uh, we're interested in is completing a lap or completing a number of laps in, in minimum time. That's what we have to do. Uh, Part of the general setup is finding a, a model of the, of the road or the track. And uh, again, this is another piece of research that we did where we used ideas from, ge uh, from differential geometry to um, produce a mathematical model of a track. Uh, this is all in the literature. You can contact me if you're interested. Uh, but it's a bit detailed, so um, I'm not going to go into that now. And the idea is that we we actually have a precursor optimal control problem, which we solve in order to characterize the track. And essentially what we want to do from that is take a raw, three-dimensional uh, GPS me measurement data for the track and co convert that data into three curvature variables which describe how the track goes up and down, how it cambers and how it goes around corners. And uh, we'll also uh, need information about the width of the road because one of the one of the rules in the optimal control problem is the vehicle has to be uh, stay on the road. And so we, 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 we conduct this calculation, uh, store the results and use it later. So on the, on the motorcycle optimal control uh, research, we used the uh, Autodroma de Mugello in, in, in Florence and Italy as our uh, test track, that was one that Ducati happened to have access to. And uh, we got some uh, curvature, we got some curvature data for the track, which we um, built into our model. The, 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 this is just a, another side comment and, and relates to um, NASCAR. And uh, sometimes we, it's important to understand how the camber changes laterally across the track. Um, and that's uh, another differential geometric challenge um, that we've uh, been looking at recently. So, okay, we, 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 we finished with the track. Now we want to talk about the bike itself. Uh, th this is a sort of a slightly facetious slide that. Um, nonetheless contains an important message. If you put rumors into bad models, you get religion, and we, we, we don't want to be in that business. So 
I'll say a few things about developing uh, high, high, high fidelity motorcycle models. The first thing to notice is these sports bikes can, can roll by up to 60 degrees. You then start having uh, contact with the side walls of the tires and all of this influences the way the machine behaves. So when we're doing tire modeling, um, we, we, we have to look at the way in which the ground contact point moves both uh, transversely and longitudinally around the tire. This contact point is not staying in the same place. The, the tire carcass has also got uh, flexibility, which we can represent using uh, linear springs. But this uh, geometric uh, situation here has to be modeled. And indeed, the, the tire model, when all said and done, produces longitudinal side uh, lateral and, and normal forces and the associated moment. So we have to figure out how uh, the tire generates these forces and moments under different uh, operating conditions. It may be important to look at the, at the thermodynamic behavior of the tire as well, because the, uh, the contact friction characteristics are temperature dependent. So uh, we know how to do that. The suspension system is um, or can be quite complicated closed kinematic loops that we have to we have to sort those all out. And I'm just going to end up by saying a couple of things about some uh, test results that we got relatively recently. this This work was published in uh, May two thousand and nineteen. The model, the model we used was um, a, a variation of Whipple's bicycle model from uh, 1898. In some ways, it's simpler than Whipple's models, and in other ways, it's more complicated. But the essential features are that we we introducing we introduce a, a pitch freedom, and this is really necessary necessitated by the the fact that the, the there's tire squash and we're going to get lateral and long longitudinal movement of the uh, of the ground contact point under different operating conditions the the tires we model as uh, toroid so donut shaped uh, objects um, we give the, the rider a lateral freedom because it's, it's important in, in motorcycle riding to be able to move your weight either side of the seat. Small steering angles are assumed. We use uh, magic formulae for the tire and uh, we put some uh, aerodynamic influences in the model as well. So um, Luca Leonelli did most of this uh, detailed work and he, he put it all together. And uh, the, the small steering angle assumption means that you can basically ignore the, the mass and the inertia of the front frame, the, the front steered assembly, which makes the model a lot simpler. Because one of the problems with optimal control problems is um, once the models become too complicated, you just can't solve them. Side view, you can see how the, the ground contact point is moving around the tire periphery under steering. Um, and then you've got to look at the, the kinematic behavior of the, of the motorcycle on the track. In other words, how it moves across the track under different control inputs. This is all pretty detailed stuff, so uh, I'm just giving you a quick flavor. So when it came to the testing, okay, this is what happened. Um, we, we, we were able to uh, arrange a, a private test session with one of Ducati's 
professional test riders, nice day, good conditions. The data was acquired with an inertial me measurement unit which connected to the bike, so we could get three orth uh, orthogonal accelerations and three orthogonal rate, uh, rate gyros. Um, we, could, we could do measurements on the suspension motion and on the steering. We cleaned the, the measurements up with the extended Kalman filtering. We used the data from the best lap. So the, the idea is, well, a professional rider's best lap is probably going to be close enough to being optimal. We did some tuning on the longitudinal and lateral uh, tire, uh, tire peak friction coefficients. The, the, this, is, this is a black art, really. It's, uh, it's too complicated to, to, to analyze formally. And uh, we got some aerodynamic uh, data from uh, the factory. And uh, the results are somewhat anonymized because uh, Ducati doesn't want them around the place too much. So we used the uh, World Superbike class um, motorcycle. Um, again, a be absolutely beautiful bike, very fast. And here we, you, you can see the comparison between the measured and predicted speed as we did one lap of uh, the uh, of, of the circuit, and then we've so we've got good comparison on the speed, good comparison on the roll angle, uh, good comparison on the curvature of the racing line, and. Uh, Reasonably good co uh, comparison on the steering. There's a little bit of a, a glitch here, and uh, we believe that there was some rubbish on the track, either a bit of oil or loose sand or something. But anyway, over, uh, overall good, uh, good uh, comparison. And then we've got here measured uh, accelerations. The left-hand diagram is what we call a GG diagram. So this is a plot of longitudinal and uh, lateral acceleration and then the uh, the the tire frictions on the on the right hand side you can see the front tire only uses the, the bottom half because you there's no drive on the front tire so the front tire is braking only and then we did comparisons on a, on a u-turn and on a chicane and I'm running out of time, so I'm going to stop here. We've got some conclusions. Simple mo model was surprisingly effective. This was, this was really an upgrade of, of Whipple's model from the 19th century. Uh, optimal control calculations for racing motorcycles are possible. Uh, I don't think this was known before uh, the work I've just described. Good ratification by testing. Um, Three-dimensional influences are important. So on motorcycles particularly, it's, uh, it's not enough to assume or do simulations on a flat road. You have to have, uh, you have to have the camber variations and the inclination angles and all that uh, put into the mix. Uh, the tire thermal behavior can be optimized. And actually, more recently, we've also been uh, looking at managing tire wear. So in other words, getting best performance from the tire while also looking after the tire. And those things are important in racing, uh, as I think is self-evident. And uh, these ideas are now moving into MotoGP. Many thanks for listening. I hope it was of some interest and uh, we'll leave it there. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Prof, uh, for a very interesting, informative and highly technical presentation. You deserve a round of applause uh, for that. I think for some of us who had sleepless nights, with the control systems and the four Maxwell equations in physics,
to see you go through this effortlessly, it just shows why you got all the cum laude in your <laughs> qualifications <laughs> and your studies. Uh, to the rest of the membership, now we're going to go to questions, as you can see. Uh, but unfortunately, we cannot have audio to any of the members. So what you can do is to capture your questions under the questions uh, tab. You can type them there. Then myself and Lizzie will go there and read them out to the professor to provide uh, some sort of answers. Uh, due to the time constraints as well, we'll only allocate 10 minutes to the questions. As you know, load shedding also started right now. So some people might be lost due to load shedding at their areas. Um, so another thing I'd like to request right now is to have the members download the handout. Under handouts tab, there is um, a document for previous uh, AGM minutes so that when we get to that one and we go through the pages, it will be easy. So now I'm going to go through the questions and see if there's anything uh, uh, over 10 minutes. So yeah, you can start typing your questions. And like I say, if the questions are not answered right now, they will be answered and then they'll be loaded onto the website where you can go and view what were the answers to your questions. I open the floor for the questions and I will read them from the tab. Currently, there are no questions. Uh, I see someone has raised their hand, but uh, unfortunately, like I said, there is no audio. Uh, so raising your hand will not assist. So it's best to capture the questions under the questions tab. Then I will read them from there. We, we do have some people who are very uh, impressed. Uh, so they, someone wrote that very interesting presentation, highlight of the year for me. We really appreciate that, uh, Brenda. Uh, still looking there. So we we'll let the time roll. Uh, and then after five minutes, if we don't have any questions at all, I think we'll just move on with the rest of the agenda. Uh, so, Lizzie, also be on the lookout on your side. We can just alternate reading out the questions uh, to, to the professor. Can you hear me? Can I ask a question? You can ask a question, Bruce. You are from a point of privilege that you've got uh, audio <laughs> on your side. Okay. I think after you, if you don't have any questions, we'll go on with the agenda. Thank you. Okay. I was just wondering if it was kind of the, the theory was put into practice. Did anybody kind of take the theory and apply it as to, to get a better race time? That's what we're, that's what we're trying to do. Um, the The main focus of this work is to a help the pit set the bike up, and b look for nuance and changes in uh, in what the rider can do on the machine. So the the, the and, and, and of course, people who are interested in vehicle dynamics and uh, and mechanics and so on, are, you know, are, you like to like to sort of work just from a curiosity point of view. But the the the, the industrial interest is really in optimizing the machine design, optimizing the track specific setup, and uh, looking for small changes that the riders might make in order to get better lap times. I mean, in the, in the, in the world of cars, we also use this work for uh, designing and improving the performance of um, high fidelity simulators that the, that, the, that the drivers use to practice on. 
Um, I, I remember in about 2015, I think, um, the the Ferrari drivers wanted to um, practice driving on, on Sochi before anybody had dri ever driven a Formula One car on that track. So I think the short answer to your question is this work uh, feeds into th three or four different uh, v verticals. Thanks a lot, uh, Prof, for the response to that question. I hope, uh, Bruce, you are happy with the answer. There's another question from John. Uh, what is the influence of change of mass during a race? Sorry, I didn't get that. What's a change of what? What is the influence of change of mass during a race, which is the weight of the driver, I would uh, assume so, the mass? I, I, I don't know anything uh, quantitative um, about that in the in the in the context of motorcycles. D to my knowledge, it, that's not a question that's been studied before, but I think obviously should be studied and probably has been studied. And um, again, in the in the context of Formula One cars. Uh, the, the, this is a very well understood issue, and uh, they're quite they're quite uh, tight formulae that tell tell you how much car faster how much faster the car becomes as it runs out of fuel. And uh, I'm assuming the the question was related to mass reduction as fuel is used. I, I suppose so, uh, Prof, but that's what it was. So there was no expansive uh, support to the question. So I think you handled it very well. I mean, from all possibilities, we've got, I think, uh, another question from an I mean, the, 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 the summary comment as far as that's concerned is that would not be a difficult problem to study. It, it would be a actually a straightforward thing to study. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, there's another question from Maneli C. Uh, it says, what effect does the rider have on the overall performance of the bike? Uh, the rider, I mean, the, the, the rider has a huge influence on the, on the, on the dynamics of the vehicle. Um, from a mass distribution point of view, from an aerodynamic point of view, uh, so, so, so that's a short question with quite a long answer. But, but, but the, the I mean the the, the, the rider's posture and uh, mass distribution and uh, how they sit on the bike are all important. And I'm sure, I mean, with people who do Formula One as well, you know, where the cars also make a huge difference. But for bikes, I, I do believe also that the, 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 the rider would make a much more uh, a, a bigger difference than within well, Formula One. You, you, you see, as compared with cars, the, the mass of the rider is a much higher percentage of the vehicle mass than is the case with cars. And for that reason, the, the, way the, the, the way the rider distributes his weight on the bike is far more important. And the way the rider sits on the bike, you've seen, you've seen race riders lying flat on the tank, coming out of, uh, out of corners and on, on, on fast straights. And then they sit up tall on the bike when they try and do lose speed quickly into a corner. So re regrettably, that's a that's another short question with a with a reasonably long answer. Yeah, thanks a lot, Prof. I, I'm sure it makes a, a lot of sense. You know uh, what you just said now. 
Uh, I think uh, we'll take the last question uh, in the interest of time. You know, we've uh, gone uh, up to that 10 minutes and then the rest, like I was saying, will be provided at a later stage. Um, there's a question from Jon Ewell. Again, uh, is, there, is there any motivation to have a front and back wheels of different diameters? Uh, I'm sure. The, I'm sure the answer is yes, but that's not something I've uh, looked at particularly because, of course, you know, changing the di diameter of the wheels is certainly going to impact directly on the steering geometry, and uh, that's probably the most important thing. Actually, is the is the impact on the on the steering geometry, but then. You know, on the other hand, if you want to change the steering geometry, um, I, th I think it would make more sense to change the steering geometry first, and then just put up the put up with the variations in the wheel diameters as a as a consequence of of uh, changing the steering and the suspension. Thank you, um, Prof. I, 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 I would also put that that question in the in the box of that, that would be pretty easy to look at. Much appreciated. Thanks a lot, Prof. Uh, uh, to all the members, I think that is all uh, when it comes to the Q and A uh, session. We'll now move on with the agenda, and then we'll go to the confirmation of the previous minutes. I hope that you have downloaded the. The, the, the minutes from where I said they'll be placed uh, under the handouts. So what I will do now, I will just go to the first page and then I'll announce if there are any things to change. But what you can do, since there is no audio, you will just write uh, on your under the questions uh, if there's anything to be changed. And then at the end, when you reach uh, page five, I will ask for someone to accept the minutes and then for someone to second. That can be done through a raise of a hand and then we will just capture it as such. Then we'll move on to the next uh, item, which will be the standing items where I will give the chairman's report. So now let's go through the minutes. Then I will just, uh, as I go through them, mention that I'm on which page and uh, if there's anything to be changed on that page, um, someone will right under the questions. Lizzie, may you please also assist me just looking at what is being written under the questions and then we'll capture it as such. And then when you get to the end, we'll provide feedback if there are anything uh, captured there and then we'll move on. Okay, thank you. So now okay. I'm on the phone. Hello, Lizzie? Yes, I said thank you, I'll do that. Okay, thank you. So I'm on the first page. I hope we are all on the first page. The one that uh, talks about the venue and the date, which was the 5th of March, 2020. So you can just scroll through the minutes. I will not read them uh, because of the time. Uh, so I've browsed through to the end of the first page. I will move to the next page and allow time for people to browse through it. Okay, that is page two, then moving to page three. This is mainly the summary of the presentation that uh, was made last year as a annual report. I'm on page four, so you can read through that. OK. 
Okay, I'm on the last page, the one uh, with conclusion and the first heading. Okay, I don't see anything under the questions. So I would then assume that we have the acceptance of the minutes for the last AGM that was held uh, in 2020 on the 5th of March. Did you see anything on your side, Dizel? Um, I don't see any hands yet. Okay, may we please uh, have uh, some hands to accept the minutes so that we can capture it as such. Okay, we've got a hand. Just want to capture whose hand is it? Okay, we've got quite a few hands that have gone up to accept the minutes. Jack, Manedi, C, and people lowered their hands immediately, but we had about four hands. Uh, may you please have some people who second uh, that uh, acceptance? May you please keep the hand up a little bit because I just want to. We've okay. got um, some... Stephanus Kriebe, Robin Waters, Sebulela. Thank you very much. Thank um, you a lot. So we've got about five um, confirmations. Okay, thanks a lot. Then we will move to the chairman's report where I'll provide the report. And then after that, we'll hand over to Bruce for the financial report. So we can have the screen to me to take over and do the presentation. I hope that you can all see my screen, uh, which contains the annual report for 2020, beginning 2021. I can see it, Simpiwe. Okay, thank you. Uh, firstly, I'd like us to take a moment of silence for our legendary members and our loved ones that passed away during the challenging COVID period. We received an email regarding the passing of Mr. Charles Anthony Whitaker, who passed away on the 29th of September of 2020. And I'm sure there are many others that we are not aware of, especially the members were affected by losing members close to their families and their loved ones. The legacy of all that have passed away will live on. May we please bow our heads and take a 30 second moment of silence before I continue. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll continue with the rest of the presentation for the annual report. As the SAIEE Eastern Cape Center, we have approximately 288 members scattered across East London, Kabeha, and surrounding areas up to Amtata. This number fluctuates over time as the members join and other members uh, leave, but uh, it has been quite stable uh, over the past three years. The members are working in electrical companies, municipalities, ESCOM, and small consulting firms. They are the engine behind our center and we thank you for your membership. We also have representatives for students and academics in Walter Sesulu and Nelson Mandela University. Uh, Lizzie has been interacting quite a lot with them 
and they have been supporting us in many respects. I hope there are some students that have connected and some of the academic staff. We thank you a lot for the support of the center. Financially, the companies in the area are reluctant to sponsor the events easily, despite all efforts by the committee members to source such funding. This has been made worse, especially in 2020 and this year due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Financially, this is just an opening balance for February 2020 and the closing balance for November 2020. Uh, Bruce will go through the in-depth of that, uh, but on his side, he's going all the way up to February 2021. So you must note if there's any difference or disparity between the two, it is due to the fact that our ending period are not showing the same uh, period. Then we've got the Eastern Cape committee members who have dedicated their time uh, to meet and to organize events, short talks, We've got uh, members in Port Elizabeth, currently known as Tabeja, and East London, and we conduct our meetings uh, via Teams on a regular basis, as you will see in the following slide. In East London, we've got myself as a chairperson. We've got uh, Philip Nicholson, who unfortunately could not make it today, as he's flying back from Jobek, who is the vice uh, chairman. We've got our secretary, Mr. Siabule Lamnyani, and another member, Mr. Darrell John Evans. Our highly capable, enthusiastic administrator, Mrs. Lizzie Bloom, is based in PE, with our outgoing treasurer, uh, Mr. Bruce Manning, Mr. Yahu Kotze, who unfortunately resigned towards the end of last year. And we wrote him a message to thank him for his contribution over the years. And we really appreciate the support that he gave uh, to the center. I hope he has joined today. And we also have Mr. Petros Stradom. The committee meetings, as you can see, with all the challenges that we had last year with COVID, we diligently and we committed to holding the meeting, providing feedback uh, from head office, interacting with head office, ensuring that our members are kept up to date with whatever that is happening within SAIE at large. The strategic highlights for 2020 are as follows. We started utilizing the SAIE Eastern Cape email to reduce ambiguity for the recipients and not to use our own personal email so that we hold it, that the integrity of the emails is from the organization. And uh, I'd like to thank Lizzie for using that uh, frequently when interacting with the members. We also offered support and guidance for the student chapters at Nelson Mandela University and Watasisulu. This, I interacted uh, with the student chapter chairpersons via emails, uh, via WhatsApp, uh, during very difficult times with the students last year. One of the highlights for last year was coordination of a work-based integration learning for P1 and P2 requirements as part of a memorandum of understanding with ESCOM. There was a notable response to the calls by the Walter Sisulu and Nelson Mandela University institutions. Out of 64 response nationally, I think ours were about 38, which is over half of the national response came from just our province. We did a aggressive marketing of SAIEE events in 2020. When it comes to national meetings and events, uh, the center chairman's meetings were conducted via Zoom, where I would dial in and listen on behalf of the center for all activities that are taking place, and I'll provide feedback during our committee meetings for the province. Unfortunately, the normal chairman's workshops and the 
AIEE annual banquet were not held this year due to the COVID pandemic, which uh, uh, ensured that all activities that are person-to-person -person contact could not take place, uh, which was quite a sad situation. But uh, for the safety of our members, we had to make sure that this is postponed to another time. When it comes to online events, by the 31st of March 2020, as you all know, COVID had already struck in the country, given that the first case was confirmed on the 5th of March with those guys that went to, I'm not sure, it was Italy, uh, 10 guys, and they came back on the 5th. It was confirmed. And then over the coming weeks after that, the numbers started to take an exponential rise. And on the 26th or 27th, we went into a full lockdown. So by the time this AGM took place, we we're already in lockdown mode and the head office managed to handle it, to handle it via an online webinar. We also conducted the 69th Bernard Price Memorial Lecture uh, entitled uh, Leaving a Legacy, presented by Roger Price, who is the grandson of Bernard Price, who the memorial is named after. That was on the 8th of October last year. A very interesting uh, presentation was given by uh, Roger. Most of the courses were canceled due to numbers, even the webinars. And this included our Eastern Cape Sprite and SAIEE fellow Roger Comrex Transformer course that we looked forward to, but unfortunately we could not support as it was also cancelled. When it comes to short talks for last year, we only had one short course, which was the Uyilo short course that was presented similarly to now uh, with the immobility e one, uh, similarly to the one that we have on uh, motorcycles. Uh, it was presented by Mr. Hitton Palmer, who's the director of Uyilo. The topic was on e-mobility. Um, just a little bit about Uyilo. Uyilo is an e-mobility technology innovation program that was launched on the 13th of March, 2013, as an initiative of the Technology Innovation Agency to serve as a national multi-stakeholder collaboration program focused on enabling, facilitating, and mobilizing the electric mobility, e-mobility industry in South Africa. As you can see on this diagram, we've got quite a few diagrams showing the innovations uh, by Uyilo. If you look on the top left, there is a solar panel array on top of a parking bay roof. And then on the right, you can see a charging uh, point for the electric vehicles. And also below, there are some other innovations that are shown that are part of the Uyilo Technology Innovation uh, Program. When it comes to the student chapter, like I said, we do have interactions with the student chapters, but we had minimal interaction that took place in 2020 due to the protests. Uh, in the beginning of the year, even before the COVID. And then the COVID itself uh, made it such that the students were sent home. Connectivity to some of the students in the far flung rural areas was difficult. And the motivation levels uh, were also very low. But uh, like I say, I did uh, contact uh, them once in a while. Information from head office regarding the participation in SAIEE cyber security chapter that was sent to the center was disseminated to the student chapters, which they welcome, and uh, further sent to their members uh, asking for participation in that cyber security chapter. The highlight of the year, as I say, when it comes to the student chapters, was the P1, P2 requirements memorandum of understanding which might yield uh, good uh, returns in far as getting those students who are short of P1, P2 to work 
in environments where they will be getting a stipend and at the same time meeting the requirements for their qualification because it's been a huge challenge especially here in the eastern cape given that there are very few companies uh, that uh, uh, take the students the current review of the decrease of student membership fees we hope that it will assist in getting more students to participate once finalized as it currently stands the student uh, annual fees are about 200 rand but as we know most of the students in these two institutions and other institutions in south africa come from previously disadvantaged and even currently disadvantaged backgrounds so that to me and you might sound as if it's nothing uh, but uh, it is quite a lot so on nationally they are looking at decreasing the student membership even looking at scrapping it but i don't think it will get to that but it might be reduced say to 50 rent which might be more affordable uh, for the students the challenges of uh, sai eastern cape center for 2020 as we know the year 2020 was a year like no other and it shook the world to the core and saie was no exception including the centers and even ours. The other challenge that we currently have now is the financial challenges and the withdrawal of payment of membership for SAIE members by SOEs like your ESCOM, Transnet, and others, and other organizations has shown an impact in the on the SAIE center membership numbers. Because now when we review the membership movement on a monthly basis, we see these people saying, I cannot afford my membership. But uh, fortunately, we have not seen much impact within the Eastern Cape. Uh, yeah, we, we hope it stays that way, which is why I was saying the numbers are still around that 288, not fluctuating a lot. Uh, also, like I mentioned before, that we had uh, access problems to students that was affected by the protests and resulting in the AGM being uh, postponed at a very short notice uh, from February to March, but we managed to hold it and uh, that was a success. Given the challenges, we still forged ahead to say, unfortunately, we cannot work in an environment without challenges. I'd like to apologize for the slide showing 2020, it's supposed to be 2021. What we want to develop, what we want to do is to develop a more effective medium to communicate with our members. Utilization of social media platform. We do have a LinkedIn uh, link uh, that we have been using, but I do believe we're underutilizing it. Uh, we're going to use the SAIEC site for events. Uh, we are in talks with Douglas to develop this uh, for the centers. We're also going to use the bulk SMS platform for events. This can be sent to our members with the assistance of the uh, head office. We're also looking at investigating the practicality of virtual tours for our members due to the challenges of COVID being still with us. And due to that, we can't go to factories like Mercedes-Benz, First National Batteries, uh, VW, to mention a few that we, we, we managed to go to last year. Still, we'd like to encourage our members to participate in the discounted webinar courses that are on offer. As I mentioned before, we had a lot of courses that were canceled due to the numbers. So we encourage our members to please look out and look at your budget. There's been a discount even on the courses now, I think by about 1,000 or 1,500 for all the webinar courses. So it's a good value for money. We'll continue to offer support and guidance for the student chapters at Nelson Mandela University and Walter Sisulu. We strive to increase member attendance figures at events, even via the webinar environment. As we can see today, we are quite happy. We see a very nice number which is similar to what we have even during our face-to-face -face meetings and want to aggressively market the SAIE calendar events 
in conclusion, I would say the current financial challenges and the withdrawal of payment of members of SIE by SOEs negatively affect the center membership numbers. The current payment options that allow for monthly payment, we hope it will assist to alleviate the situation. As you know, now you can make payments on a monthly basis instead of a once-off amount for your membership. We also have the reward program where you can use some of the points uh, to assist you with the payment. And on top of that, there is the early bird uh, discount, which is offered for members that pay before the end of March. Even if you started paying in installments from November to end of March, you still get that early bird discount. One thing that we have learned from COVID-19 is that some opportunities can emerge during a calamity, as we see more and more online businesses mushrooming. Unfortunately, though, there is a lot of stress that is accompanied by uncertainty. So we would advise for our members who feel that they are undergoing a lot of stress, either through loss of jobs or uncertainty as what's going to happen just generally, please seek assistance, uh, psychological help. No one is stronger on their own. I think we work together as a team and as a group. So talk to your family members, talk to other people, but ensure that you observe the social distances and all the other measures uh, that are imposed upon us by the government to ensure that we combat uh, COVID-19. I strongly believe that our perseverance, strong leadership, and utilization of resources at hand can assist us to survive the treacherous future ahead of us. And also, I'd like to thank all the committee members for their support during my tenure as a chairperson over the past two years. Uh, without preempting anything, we will go through the process of nominations and the voting where I will unpack exactly what will be happening going forward when it comes to the committee members for 2021. Uh, thank you very much. What I will do now, I will bring up the slides for the financial reporting for Bruce to go through them. Uh, I hope Bruce, you can just tell me maybe to go to the next slide. Thank you, Simpiwe. Okay, I'm just gonna go to slideshow. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Simpiwe, for all your your presentation. It was very interesting. Yeah, so just to, to go through the financial summary quickly, do you wanna go to the next slide? So our income, normally we would get income from CPD events. Uh, so all of those, uh, the top four items, there's no, been no income. The only income we had this year was from the head office, um, which is basically from the member fees. So the income came down significantly from previously. Uh, the expenditures also come down. Um, a lot of the catering and refreshments has come down. Uh, I think we had some events right at the beginning of the year, but then as, as soon as COVID hit, it will... Uh, uh, catering and that all came to an end. So we had a surplus of 9,000. So just to com uh, confirm the balance, um, so the opening balance 1st of January was 78,000, the closing balance of 88,000. So that's where we're standing at the moment. And then the next slide. Okay, just a conclusion COVID had a big impact on SAIE activities in 2021 resulting in a reduction in both income and expenditure, but we still had a small surplus. The impact of COVID is expected to continue in 2021. Meeting online has enabled more cost-effective use of resources, and hopefully some of this will continue. Meeting together again in person will happen soon. I don't know if that is, that's my hope.
Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Bruce, for that presentation. Uh, I don't know if there are any questions uh, regarding the presentation and the, um, the two presentations, but I think we can just uh, carry on with the interest of time now and the fear of load sharing. We'll go to the next point, which is the introduction of nominated office bearers and the voting. But sorry, unfortunately, yes. Yeah, sorry, before we go to that, can I also just give a vote of thanks just for everybody for all of the hard work this year. I think obviously to Simpiwe, I think he did the most being the chairman. So thank you very much, Simpiwe, for all your hard work this year. And um, I think a lot of people don't realize how much goes on behind the scenes. So we appreciate you, all your effort and the, the way that you did it as well. We really appreciate it. And then to Liesl, obviously, um, for all her work as secretarial work that she does. So big thank you to Liesl as well. And the committee to Philip Nicholson, um, Daryl, Sia for being our scrub. It's nice to have some young guys on the committee. Uh, Manalisi, uh, Petrus, and then obviously Yaku, who was with the committee earlier on. So just a big thank you. And then I don't know if David Limbia is professor still with us. But just very much a big thank you for that talk. It was very interesting. Um, and also to all the speakers over the year who have given talks, uh, small talks. We've had some very interesting talks. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh... Bruce for such uh, kind words. So now we will move over to the 6.3 and 6.4, which is the introduction of nominated office bearers for 2021 and the voting. Uh, unfortunately, we did not receive any nominations for this year, but it's not a train smash. So what we normally do as a committee is that we sit uh, at our first meeting and we look at the positions uh, for the committee for the year that is coming. And then that meeting was on the 28th of January. So what I will do now, I will read out the changes to the committee, uh, and then I will request some hands to accept those changes and to endorse, and then we'll capture it as such. Like I said before, there's only one change to the committee currently. It is Yak who has uh, uh, resigned. Then let me announce the changes that have taken place that were discussed by the committee. What will happen for 2021? I will become the immediate past chairman, but will still serve in the committee as per the bylaws and the constitution uh, does allow for, for such. Mr. Philip Nicholson, who is the current vice chairman, will ascend to the chairman position. Mr. Bruce Munnings, who just gave a financial presentation now, and currently our treasurer, will be the new vice chairman. Mr. Petra Stradom, who is a member, will become the new treasurer. So this shows also that within the committee itself, there's an allowance for progression and movement within the positions. People don't just become members forever. So on that particular note, I would like to see some hands showing support of the nominations that were made within the committee by moving the members that are currently there. Uh, yes, I open to the floor now for a raise of hands and then Lizzie will capture the names uh, of the people and we'll win at it as such. Uh, Lizzie? I am here. Yes. Um, we've got Christopher Futsu Majora, Alan Roberts, um, Ronald Bartlett. Thank you, gentlemen. Stefan Schreber, um, Sedu, thank you very much, gentlemen, for thank, your Thanks a lot, uh, gentlemen. I, I, I think on that note then, that is the acceptance and the endorsement of the committee as it stands right now. 
hopefully for 2022, we'll have people raising their hands to join the committee. And I think a person like myself who has served for quite a few number of years now will be stepping down now, even as a past anything, just to invest my time in other things. On that note, then we move over to general. Are there any other things under general? Uh, this can also be captured under questions. Like I said, we unfortunately do not have access to the chat for the general members. And also the audio is also something that we don't have access to. So as I note now, I don't see anything under general, but I think given that we are all aware of the Eastern Cape uh, Center email that Lizzie has been using. So any other, you know, input regarding what improvement can be done by the committee and, and things like that are highly welcome. Uh, they can be communicated. We did not wait for the AGM or formal meeting to raise any issues. So the members are really asked, and I plead with you to do so. Uh, on that note, then I think we go to point number eight, which is the date of the next meeting. I think it is pretty much sure now. Okay, there's a hand that is up, but I hope the people are aware of the fact that a hand on its own will not do anything if there's nothing written under questions. So if there's something, may you please write it under questions so that we can maybe put it under general. But uh, a discussion within the committee was to say, this would be early in 2022. We can't really decide on the exact date right now. So it would be right about the same time, uh, February, March. So if the members are happy with that, maybe we can see a, a, a raise of hands just to, to give us comfort that people are happy with that. And then I think after that, we will have the meeting closed. Yes, we got quite a few hands up. Uh, I hope they are for this and not raised for something else. Uh, you managed to see that little as well. And um, I do see hands up. Unfortunately, we cannot know what you um, state um, if you don't put it under the questions. Yes, um, if so it's related if you to have something. Anything, please type it under the questions. Um, yeah. Could but, I just maybe mention while the members are um, typing their questions or their requests, um before we could maybe put it under general there will be communications almost um in advance about webinars coming up in april and may um we've got mr bruce manning that will be doing a short talk um on renewable energy in africa and then we're looking up to pr a proposed short talk by trevor manis on lighting protection systems but we will um, email all of you in advance the webinar details. Thanks a lot, uh, Lizzie, for that announcement. Then I would uh, take it that the meeting is adjourned. And uh, thanks a lot, and do have a great evening. Thanks, Minx, for arranging this uh, for us from head office. I I think it is one of many to take place in the future. Any words from you, Minx, before we close the meeting? Nothing from me, and thank you very much for the wonderful meeting. Thank you. So the meeting is urgent. We can all disconnect. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Sabira.